Now I want to talk to you about a very remarkable woman. And we know a lot about her. It's uh, kind of amazing. Uh, we have her writings. And we have some manuscripts with illustrations. But um, unfortunately, the original has been lost. So we want to talk about Hildegard of Bingham, uh, who is from the Rhineland. Uh, she's Ger today we'd say she's German. Uh, and as you can see, she lived to be a very old lady. Some of these nuns did. Um, the life expectancy was generally very, very short for women, but that's because they often died in childbirth. So since the nuns um, would be free of that, uh, as we can see, at least uh, Hildegard and some others do tend to live to a, a ripe old age, uh, which I guess gives them lots of time to do the many things that she accomplished. Hildegard of Bingham is a visionary nun. Uh, she's an abbess. She's, uh, as well, well, we'll talk a little bit more about her, too. Let's talk about uh, the manuscript we're going to talk about uh, is known as Scidius, and it probably dates from about 1141 or 42 onward. The visions occurred in 1141, and then the manuscript would have been done slightly shortly thereafter. Uh, Scidius is kind of an abbreviation or uh, for Scivius Domini, or know the ways of the Lord. So it's sort of like no ways, <laughs> know the ways. Um, the manuscript uh, from Rupertsburg was either in Dresden or Wiesbaden. I found reference to both, but the, the manuscript disappeared during World War II. We don't know that it was destroyed it is possible that it will still surface. You may know that uh, you know, the Nazis were confiscating lots of uh, artwork. And um, when the Russians came in, uh, they often confiscated the, 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 that artwork too, um, sometimes to ordinary soldiers, sometimes other people. And uh, it found its way, a lot of it found its way back to Russia. And only now are we starting to see art exhibits of some of the works that were thought to be lost. Um, it's also possible that uh, some of the manuscripts and paintings and things were, were stored somewhere um, and maybe someday discovered or revealed. Maybe not, we'll see. Um, what do we have, what, if the manuscript vanished, what am I showing you? Well, before it vanished, Black and white photographs were taken. I'm not showing you those. Um, and a handmade colored copy, which seems, if you look at the black and white photographs um, and then you look at the manuscript, they seem to be a very close copy. And that was made you know, around 1930, 1927 to 33. So the colored images that we're showing you are from this copy. A uh, little bit about the life of Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, she was, I think, something like the 10th child, but she was a, uh, a child in a very large family. And she came after a lot of other children. And what often happens is that these, if you've, if you've got plenty of children um, to inherit uh, and to make uh, uh, marriages that are uh, very useful, the younger children may be given to a convent or a monastery. And this was what happened to Hildegard. At eight years old, she was taken to the monastery at Diesbodenberg and given to the care of the anchorist Uta. Now, I will explain a few things here. Monastery, well, uh, there were monasteries that had both nuns and monks. And in this case, uh, Uta was literally, she was an anchoress. She wasn't walking around the monastery. She was walled into one room, and then there'd be one little window from which she could you know, pass things out and get food in and, and things like this. And basically, it was uh, considered extremely pious, um, and uh, a person who gives themselves to the contemplation of God. There's some question about was Hildegard at eight years old walled up with her? Uh, was it later? Um, uh, she gets out later, and she, in fact, she does a lot of traveling uh, for a nun. Um, she goes off and she actually preaches, which I could get, what? 
a woman preaching to not just to her, you know, to her nuns, but uh, going out to places like Cologne. Cologne. Um, she it did. She used to be very famous, to be perfectly frank. Um, the Uta and her, um, you know teaches Hildegard, and they get such a reputation for piety that other women become nuns. Other nuns join them. And then when Uta, uh, Uta dies, Hildegard becomes the abbess of these nuns. So now you're in this double uh, abbey with you know, monks and nuns. They wouldn't be in the same space. You'd have a big wall between them. Um, and of course, we don't know exactly what, what went on. But Hildegard uh, believes that God has told her to start a new convent uh, at Rupertsburg, literally on a mountain, uh, where there are some ruins, and she uses those uh, as part of the building material to build her new uh, church and convent. Well, as you can imagine, there's a lot of opposition for, from the monks. Um, Hildegard and is, is bringing them fame and revenue, <laughs> frankly. Um, and they'd like to control her, um, one, one assumes. Uh, she, on the other hand, <laughs> is not really satisfied with what's going on at, at uh, the, the monastery. And uh, she has a vision that says God wants her to build a new convent. And so she eventually is able to do that. Uh, and then about 15 years later, she she founds another convent at Bingham. We said she's a visionary nun. She's had visions since she was a child, but they became particularly intense uh, when she was in her 40s. And the, vision, the series of visions that become the book Scivius uh, begin, begin in 1141. Uh, and there's a, you know, much description. I've just excerpted a little bit here so you can sort of get the idea. Uh, the heavens were opened and a blinding light of exceptional brilliance flowed through my entire brain. And suddenly I understood the meanings of the narratives and the Psalms and you know, the various holy, uh, the Bible and you know, holy writings and whatever. Um, so it gives her this, this, this light uh, which makes her feel that she really does understand what's going on. She had the command from God that she write down her visions. Um, and she's a prolific writer. It's not just her visions. Um, it's also uh, songs, plays, uh, just all sorts of things. Hildegard has a unique honor, a unique distinction. She is the only woman with her own book in Patrologius Cursus Completus. Most of you don't know what Patrologia's Cursus Completus is, so I'm going to tell you. Patrologia is the father's, Cursus is, is uh, works, and Completus, of course, is complete. So it's the complete works of the fathers of the church, and uh, definitely one mother, <laughs> is Hildegard. In the 19th century, J.P. Ming uh, brought these all together in a two series, uh, many, many hundreds of volumes. Uh, one was Ceres Latina. These were the Latin fathers of the church, the Western fathers who wrote in Latin. And uh, Ceres Graeca, the Greek fathers, with a Latin translation, in case you didn't read Greek. And if you were to go to one of the libraries that has this, you would see you know, an entire wall with just book after book after book after book. We don't have that at ETSU. Um, the closest place uh, to see the words of Patrologia Cursus Completus that I know of is um, the Evangelical School for Religion. And they have a microfiche copy. And I haven't been there for a long, long time. Um, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they also have the online copy. There is an online version, but it's, it's subscription. It's not something you just go to the internet and get. Um, I've seen that at Catholic University, too. Um, but uh, essentially, this is the source book 
uh, for all the scholars who are studying uh, medieval writers, medieval theology, uh, every time you want to quote something <laughs> from you know, St. Augustine or St. Jerome or even you know, minor people, uh, you're usually putting PL and then the volume number and then the column number, um, or PUG if it's uh, Greek. Um, so that's a, just an amazing series of books. Uh, and extremely useful for medieval scholars and uh, theologians and such. Okay, Hildegard was a visionary, a writer, even a preacher. She wrote music and lyrics. She may have written the first musical play. She wrote the first morality play. And she's the first composer whose biography is known. So, um, I assume the website's still up, but uh, when I was first looking at material for Hildegard of Bingham, one of the websites I found was from a music department. Um, she's also, uh, people have suggested that she has uh, good scientific knowledge for her day, and that uh, she writes about medicine, which is almost unheard of for a woman, almost. There are some exceptions, but uh, very interesting. Now, who created these illustrations? They probably were created by the nuns at her convent, under her direction and to her design. And some, there's some reasons for that. The iconography is very original. Iconography is the uh, subject matter, the symbolism, uh, just the way the images uh, are shown. You, when you do have traditional, many of it's not traditional at all. You, know, you can't find antecedents in uh, medieval art. Um, but when you do have traditional mo motifs, they are transformed in an entirely new way, which makes us think that you know, they're, they're very, very original and probably coming from the person, uh, at least the, the directions coming from the person who uh, had the visions. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. I want to look at this uh, picture here of Hildegard of Bingham. Uh, it is showing Hildegard receiving her visions, or at least uh, receiving her visions and writing them down. Uh, she is shown holding a wax tablet, which was what she could write her visions on, and then they would be copied into a text on parchment. Of course, she can make corrections in the wax. This is a common thing to do. Notice at the top there are these, these uh, sort of red squiggles coming down from the arch. These are the tongues of fire, the fiery tongues of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you read Acts of the Apostles, uh, after Christ has died and uh, resurrected and gone to heaven, the apostles are in Jerusalem, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as fiery tongues. So these fiery tongues, uh, these flames, uh, show that Hildegard was receiving her visions from the Holy Spirit, that it was God himself that was inspiring her. Now you see she's separate. She's in a little kind of cubicle, the architectural cubicle, um, with her confessor, whose name is Volmar, uh, sticking his head <laughs> through a kind of a little a niche or a window here, uh, and he's going to write down her vision. This was something that, that happened no matter how learned you were. Um, you usually had to have your confessor write down the vision and get it approved. Now, Hildegard was a very, very clever woman. Um, she knew that she had to have approval of the church, and she literally sent copies uh, to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who approved it, you know, and so the Pope approves it, and St. Bernard of Clairvaux approves it. Uh, you're, you're definitely orthodox. Um, of course, we said before, now who painted the images of the Scivias? Uh, during the 19th century, they, usually assumed that it had to be a male scribe. Uh, and they had no real reason. It was just, you know, women are incapable of doing original work. Uh, they're incapable of being artists. Uh, so, you know, I must have been a man. I want to say, duh. <laughs> um, or as I put it a little more elegantly, prejudice is not evidence. More likely, it was the nuns under Hildegard's direction, and there's more than one hand in it. There's slightly different styles, uh, but it looks like the, the same sort of uh, person is sort of telling them how to, pay, how to show things. Um, it has been suggested that Hildegard was the designer 
uh, she may not have painted every page, but that she, she may have done sketches, uh, that she oversaw the project, that she <laughs> gave directions. And it's interesting, um, one of the people that, uh, not one of the people, but some of the people who believed that Hildegard was the actual designer were people who actually saw the manuscript, uh, the German graduate students from the earlier part of this century uh, who actually examined uh, the manuscript rather than just the copy. MS, incidentally, is the abbreviation for manuscript. MSS is the plural, manuscripts. Or if you're German, you have a capital H and an S for Handschriften, which is manuscript in German. Um, Madeleine uh, Cavanis has written several articles about Hildegard of Bingen's images. Uh, the images, I should say, she's written them about the images that are in uh, the manuscripts of Hildegard of Bingen. And she definitely proposes that it was uh, the nuns under Hildegard's direction. And she actually sees her doing some sketches and uh, you know, how she imagines it being done. She has some pretty good evidence. Uh, we mentioned the originality of the composition, that no or little use of standard images. Uh, and Hildegard of Sars says that her visions are not from human invention, so uh, the visual form is not following the, 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 the pictorial traditions. And also, and this, this seems to be pretty good evidence, it has been said that Hildegard's visions uh, may stem from migraine headaches. Um, and the images also reflect some of the characteristics of migraines. Now, I want to be real clear here. I don't mean, oh, her vision is just a migraine and she's fooling herself. I'm not going to take any stance about things like that. Um, one of the interesting things is that even if there are sometimes physical um, things that, that lead people to visions, a, a lot of it has to do with the way you interpret it. So I let uh, theologians uh, discuss that, and uh, I suspect people's uh, prejudices one way or the other will interpret uh, that. But it does seem fairly clear from her descriptions of the blinding light, for example, um, that she was subject to migraines, and that this led her into the visions. Um, you know, whether it's the gateway or, you know, I, I'll let people decide what it is. Uh, certainly for her, it is an intense spiritual as well as physical experience. Uh, some of the things that happen during very bad migraine attacks is what they call a visual field deficit, in which you have a black hole that expands, or, remember Hildegard talks about the blinding night, or it can be blindingly bright. And also, um, Oftentimes, they seem to have points of light with jagged edges, and they seem to shimmer. And we see these little, uh, we see things in the um, illustrations that suggest to Cavanis uh, that Hildegard was directing uh, the illustrations. The colors in the Scivius uh, also reflect colors of migraine auras. And the colors are not always described in the text. So it can't just be, you know, oh, she said that, she saw it, she had her migraine, and, and she describes it. Uh, one of the interesting things, actually, is the use of silver, which uh, tarnishes. But she seems to be using, or the artist seems to be using silver uh, to show this scintillating, li uh, uh, scintillating light uh, that shimmers. Um, and it's not always just, you know, gold is one color, but silver is another that you see. Um, she, around, well, as we look at some of these images, you'll see around the contours there are little light dots. And um, Cavanagh suggests that this uh, makes the contour seem to shimmer, you know, gives it a little bit of irregularity, and that these uh, may be uh, related to the, the, the light dots, the light uh, points that you would see during the, the migraine attack. Um, she also points out these really unusual stars. They don't look like stars in any other medieval manuscript. They're very irregular. They have uh, different, uh, pr different proportions, different shapes, uh, uh, more prongs coming out. And she suggests that they are like uh, scotoma, or the shimmering spots in migraine attacks. Um, 
and they seem to move rapidly. And she talks about how dynamic uh, the stars, and you see that in the, the image we're looking at here, seem to be uh, you always, you, you actually, as much as you can with the, uh, you know, the flat images, uh, you try to get a feeling of, of dynamism and, and movement. Uh, she also said in some, uh, some migraine attacks actually have what they call fortification spectra or architectural shapes like crenellations that appear to the sufferer. And uh, this is kind of interesting because we do see a lot of architectural shapes in Hildegard of Bingham's images. But also remember she, you know, she had her vision and said, God told me to build this new church, this new convent. And she would undoubtedly, as the founder, uh, be overseeing the building, uh, maybe even doing, uh, in connection with the master mason, who knows, maybe some designing. Um, so, you know, we, we can only speculate there. So Hildegard's descriptions of the characteristics of migraines uh, are reflected in the images. They indicate that Hildegard was the director or the designer of the illustrations, even if she's not the person who actually put the paint down on the um, pages of the, of the manuscript. Uh, there's a lot of jagged edge forms. Uh, there's uh, this idea of the, the, the lights that uh, either black or white, uh, even black stars. I mean, you know, how unusual is that? 